Good day, everybody. Uh, wonderful to have you with us again today. And uh, as you know, we're studying the book of Genesis together. And so if you are new to this group, well, welcome. And we hope that you'll benefit as you pick up with us. We're now in chapter 24. And so we are coming to a very important chapter in the book of Genesis, probably according to some of the commentators, one of the most important chapters in the book. And uh, it's a chapter which is very hard to give a title to. Um, you will see that in the Bible itself, it is simply called Isaac and Rebekah. In other words, we're talking about Abraham's son and his wife, Rebekah, and how they got together, and how they came together. It's a very prosaic title, just very simple, and basically it is what the chapter is about. But it's about a lot more. You know, Abraham believed that God had a future for his family, but now he was old, and Sarah has now gone. Uh, she's died. And so how was this all going to work out? He was an old man. Uh, Sarah was 127 years old when she died. Abraham was 10 years older. They've got this one and only son. They did have another son, Ishmael, but he's out of the camp and out of the picture, really. And so how was Abraham going to continue his progeny and how were the promises of God to make him um, the father of a great nation of people? How was that going to work out? Because it's the beginnings, you see, of the story of salvation. It's the beginnings of, of, of what's going to happen over a period of long years till the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the beginnings of when uh, they would have kings and prophets and people like that who would help people like us now at this stage in history to look back and understand how the plan of salvation worked and what it was all about and why, who God is and why he acted as he did and, and what were the things that were offensive to God and what were the things that pleased God and God's greatness and his mercy as well as his justice and his wrath. All these things were going to be revealed in the future, but how was that going to work out if Isaac didn't have a wife and progeny? So that was the sort of problem. Now, when you read the chapter for yourself, you will see that it's a lot more than just Isaac and Rebecca. That is the main thing in the chapter. But it's really the end of an era. I could have called this chapter the end of an era, but it wouldn't have covered everything because there's so much in it. There's faithfulness and there's prayer and there's guidance from God and there's a picture of Eastern wedding arrangements. And finally, we end up at the end of the chapter with a new Abraham, who is Isaac, and a new Sarah, who is Rebecca. In fact, we read at the end of the chapter that she is taken as Isaac's bride into Sarah's tent, which would have been something that would have been very offensive to the people had she not been regarded very greatly and seen as the one who should take that position of Sarah as far as the future was concerned, as far as the people were concerned. So it's all very full of things and lots of not, not, too, not too many complications, but lots of difficult things to understand if you don't know the background. And it's very hard to say everything on a short YouTube presentation like we have here today. Nevertheless, we've got to make a start. And so I'm going to read to you from God's Word, from Genesis chapter 24, and just the first nine verses. So Genesis 24, verses 1 to 9, reads like this. Now Abraham was old well advanced in years. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, uh, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. 
but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son, for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? And Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land, he will send his angel before you. And you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. I'm going to stop reading there. And I think we should make a start just here and talk about the subject of believing the word of God, believing that God really means what he says. Because what Abraham does in the first place is this. He says, as a step one to his, to his um, servant, he says, go and find a wife for my son. Abraham was old, and Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, so here is a servant who is trusted. He's not named here in this portion of scripture, but he's a trusted man. And oh, how we long for people of integrity and people of trust today who are in high places, don't we? But here was the trusted man with integrity who had charge of all that he had. He said, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of Canaan. And so he makes his servant take a special kind of oath by putting his hand under his thigh. Now that was a way of saying that the progeny of, of his, that he will have a son who will have progeny um, and who will have and be part of that long list of people that will develop into a large tribe. So it's talking about the spread of the tribe and many children when he takes an oath like that, putting your hand under my thigh. Do you see? So put your hand under my thigh. And then <clears throat> he says, go to my country, to my kindred, and take a wife for my son. And then Abram says, see that you never take my son back there. Because why? Why? The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring, I will give this land. That is the land of Canaan, where Abraham was living at the time. Abraham had traveled a long way from his own kindred, a long way from where he was born, and he was now resident in the land of Canaan. And there he had all his people, his tribal people, his little clan that he had. And God says to him, to your offspring, I will give this land. Now the promises are more than that. And we've covered them in the previous chapters. And Abraham says, he will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. What does the angel thing do? The angel was Abraham's way of saying, God will guide you. God will guide you. You see, go and find my son a wife. <clears throat> Do not take this wife from the Hittite people, but go back to my people and find a wife from there. Now, this servant obeyed Abraham. And Abraham said to him, you will find a wife there because God will send his angel before you. And so... Do not be worried about not finding the right wife. You will choose her and God will guide you. He will send an angel to guide you. So God will be faithful to his covenant to me because God has spoken to me and told me that he will make me into a great nation. Make Sarah and myself, Sarah the mother of the nation. I will be the father of the nations. And from us will come this great group of people known, finally, as the Israelites. 
So go and find us, my son, a wife. And so that is belief in God's word, in God's promises. And there was no wife on the horizon, no one to be seen. Lots of, lots of illegible women living in the land, but they were all Canaanites. And the Canaanites were notorious idolaters. And Abraham, having met God, Abraham, to whom God had revealed himself, saw and knew in his heart that he could never allow any of the other nations that were in the land at that time to be part of him or his family because idolatry was a total uh, reneging on any commitment to God. It was a refusal to obey the great mighty creator of the universe. Now, don't you think it's wonderful that he believed the promises like that? You know, you couldn't see it. He never saw it in his own lifetime. God had dealt with him and he'd had his ups and downs, but he never saw the promises of God fulfilled in his lifetime, but believed that it would be fulfilled. And you know, you and I need to believe that. We need to believe uh, that God is true and faithful to his promises. We should not despair as much as we do should not get us depressed as much as we do. Although I know that many of you are probably going under tremendous problems at this point in time, and you may have real uh, reason to feel this despairing. But don't despair. If you're a Christian, the Lord Jesus said, I will be with you always, even in the middle of your darkest moments. Because you mustn't forget that even your darkest moments are in his hands. Nothing happens to you without him being in charge or without him willing it or without him sovereignly guiding you so that you may grow and develop through it all. So believe him, believe his word and trust him for the future. Then the next thing that I want to point out to you from this little passage is that Abraham says to his servant, let there be no wife from the Canaanites, no one from the Canaanites. In verse three, he says, um, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth that you will not take a wife from my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Now, all through the scriptures, you will discover that the Canaanites are included in the list of those people who were not permitted to into the company of the Israelites, into 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 Israelite territory and their, their, and their women were not allowed to marry Israelite men and the Israelite men were not, not allowed to marry Canaanite women and so on. You will find that in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and in Exodus chapter 34 and in Numbers chapter 25. And why is that? Because the Canaanite people were a pagan people. They worshipped false gods, man-made gods. I, they were idolaters and their practices went with what they believed. And so Abraham saw that, knew that, and he knew that if there was any connection between the Canaanites and his own people, he knew very well that the human heart would go after the Canaanite gods and after the fleshly, sensual ways of worship and the lusts and the freedoms of the Canaanite people to do as they pleased. And so he did not allow that. God did not allow that. No one could come from the Canaanites into Israel and the Israelites were not allowed to be part of the Canaanite people. And so no wife from the Canaanites. And why was that? Because the people of God were meant to be holy and you're not to, not to join yourself to unholy people. Don't, don't get yourself linked up with people who are going to lead you astray. And that is what this was all about. And people don't really need that lesson today so that we who are Christians remember who we are. But the world is so impressive and the world is so pushy, it pushes its way into our lives so that we find even our Christian children adopting um, actions and thinking patterns from the world today and there's constant need for correction 
and many, many times they won't take the correction. So what we need is people to teach us the Bible and to help us to remember that we are to be a holy people and the people set apart for God. And that what lies behind this particular command. Don't get connected with them. They're going to lead you astray. And that reminds me to say what I quite often say these days. I've said before on this program, choose good friends, choose noble friends, and choose Christian friends. That does not mean that we should not be friendly with non-Christian people. But let's make sure that they're people of some form of nobility, that we can speak to sensibly and who are rational and not low in their thinking and that are open. And, that, and, and let's make sure that our main connections are people who are connected to Almighty God. And if you see anyone connected to some non-Christian person, you need, and, they, and they follow after that non-Christian person, you know they're in trouble. They're in deep trouble. And if any young person happens to be watching this, let me just say this to you. If your boyfriend or girlfriend or fiancé does not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to rethink what you are doing. Because although your feelings may overpower everything else at this moment, 10 years down the road after you are married, you're going to discover that you're in deep trouble between what's happening in your home, in your relationship and your conscience. So I want to say to you to take this word seriously. Right, then the next thing that it says in this little passage is that the servant says to Abraham, what happens if the girl I go won't come and I find her? The girl I go to says yes, and I find her and that she won't come. She says, no, no, I don't want to leave my family. I don't want to leave my, my connections here behind. I've got friends here and family here. Let him come to me. Should I take him there? That's what he says. And Abraham says, see to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, took me from my father's house, from the land of my kindred, spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. Don't take him back there. My friends, this is a word to us today to remind us that the people that we are connected with must be covenant people. You see, this is what was happening here. Abram was saying to his servant, you must find a woman who will become a covenant woman, who will enter into the covenant that I've made, that, that God made with me, and that I'm, I'm bringing my family into. She must be prepared to embrace that covenant, that God will be our God, and we will be his servants. She must be willing to share Isaac's destiny. She mustn't bring Isaac into her family life to share her destiny, but she must share Isaac's destiny because Isaac's destiny is her destiny. She will have a great role to play in the, in the unfolding of the gospel if she comes back with you. But don't take Isaac back there. My family, although they are my family and God has revealed himself to us, nevertheless, they're not all where they ought to be spiritually. Don't take Isaac back there and don't let him go back there. Good word to remind us not to backslide, friends, not to cool off, not to go backwards, to go forwards. Always keep your eye on the future. Keep your eye on the fact there's a new world coming. And keep your eye on the fact that there is an eye in heaven watching you. Hel and, and that we need to be praying every day that God will help us to be the godly, holy people that we are meant to be carrying out the destinies that he intended for us. We haven't all got destinies like becoming preachers and missionaries and things like that. Just ordinary people with ordinary jobs, running ordinary families, but part and parcel of the vast group of people who will be able to say on that great, wonderful day when the Lord Jesus reappears that God is my God and Jesus was my Savior. It's a wonderful thing to say Jesus is my Savior and not everybody can say it because it's got to be given to you to be able to say that. Jesus is my saviour. And then the last word is this, that 
Abraham says to his servant, his servant says, what, what happens if I fail? And Abraham says, God will send his angel before you. You won't fail. You will be guided. Do you hear that? You will be guided. But even if you can't make out what's happening and you decide that you can't make a choice, then I release you from your vow. God will make a way some other way. Some other door will open. God's will will always be done. And it's good for us to say, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And let it be done in me. Whatever your will is for me, you do it. Because that's the best place to be, is in the middle of God's will. And of course we know that God's will, first and foremost, is that we should know his Son, our Lord Jesus. Surrender ourselves to him. And then let him take our lives along whatever pathway he wants to take it for his glory. Do you have a purpose in life? When you become a Christian, you are part of a very great purpose. Now, God bless you, and I hope that you'll join me again next week. Mm -hmm.